This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. And uh, the first speaker is Felix Kravacek, Kravacek uh, from the University of Oxford, who is talking about restaging Russia's controversial past <coughs> into complete mobilization. fun to see whether or not Russia is part of Eastern Europe. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> it has changed over the last couple of years quite drastically. But it's interesting to see that you consider it uh, being part of Eastern Europe also in a memory perspective, I guess, of what makes Europe. But today I want to turn to political youth mobilization. And so just to give a, a bit of context, um, when Gorbachev rose to power in the 1980s in the Soviet Union, young people were amongst the first to mobilize and to tear down the Soviet symbols of power. And as part of what came to be called neformalis, or informal groups, they expressed a longing for an imaginary West, and also they, they expressed their sort of dissatisfaction with the heroic narratives of the Great Patriotic War, known in general as the Second World War, um, that they were socialized in during Soviet times. And these mobilized young people who rejected certain interpretations of the past, they weren't working in isolation, but they were also interlinked, entangled with larger macro narratives changing of the past. And one example is, for instance, Yevgeny Yevtushenko, who published his poem Fuku in sort of a literally, literacy vanguard magazine called Novi Mir, The New World. Um, where he criticized Stalinism, the Gulag system, and so on and so forth. And in this poem, Foucault was actually taken up in Pravda in 1987. So this youth mobilization which started in 1985, 1984, which questioned certain well-established myths, was something which was entangled with the, the adult way of seeing the past. Um, and very similarly, the youth remain of very high importance for understanding the narratives of the past in contemporary Russia. Um, the sort of one generational shift 15, 20 years after the USSR's collapse, the memory of the Soviet past began to be fundamentally reinterpreted. Stalin, and that's sort of just the symbol of the whole array of, of changing meanings, turned from what he is known in the West um, into a symbol of Russian strength. If someone who liberated Europe from the fascist threat, who actually assured the grandeur of the Soviet Union, the Soviet Union being a, um, being a key political player on the global stage. And Gorbachev, on the other hand, became to be known over the last five to six years as the traitor, as the democratic traitor of the one who sold Russia to the West. And so that's one entire bag of Democrats. Um, and so what I want to do today is to explore these changing narratives of the past by looking at youth mobilization in contemporary Russia and the mnemonic practices is obtaining. Um, and so what we're going to do, I'll briefly sort of present the perspective of entangled memory, which I think is quite helpful for understanding how Russian youth mobilizes and what Russian youth does with the past, and briefly present what these movements are. The Great Patriotic War is the main mnemonic signifier that has been renegotiated, and then some recent issues which revolve around the meaning of, of Crimea, and World War One, which is indeed not a typo, but for most people maybe surprisingly that World War One comes up in a discussion on Russia. So entangled memory was developed during latently conspiratorial meetings and suburban holiday apartments in provincial German cities. I was part of these meetings, um, and eventually the meetings culminated in sort of a series of conferences, a book, and a couple of articles at this thing on the bot, uh, top right, the Center for Interdisciplinary Studies. In, in terms of memory, the idea draws on criticism of the second wave of memory studies, which Aston Allen and Jeffrey Olding formulated over the last couple of years in particular. So what do we do in entangled memory with the four other people that you can see on the slide? So we aim at departing from what came to be known as the first and second wave of memory scholarship. I guess you're all familiar with this because it's usually the footnote number one that you can see in every article of memory. That's the first wave, that's the second wave, here we are. Um, that's of course a 
grossly simplifying narrative, right, which reduces the first wave to Morris Halfwag's work in the 1920s and 30s, which is completely contextualized, and which reduced the second wave to piano art and piano da 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 In between, there's just sort of big silence, which is rubbish itself as well. Um, so, but beyond this problem of the reception history, um, there are also a number of other problems with the second wave, which we started to explore as part of the chain of memory. And I guess, in a nutshell, the problems are that memory scholarship has tended to assume homogeneity of commemorating groups and privilege tangible manifestations of memory. So the study of how a given group remembers a certain event illustrates the problems with the second wave in the aftermath of the run. This runs the risk of essentializing and static treatment of social groups. And of course it's sort of intuitive to, to take this road, but the problem is that it neglects the mutual dependence, the traveling of narratives of forms and practices between groups. And I think part of a third wave, if you want to move on from the second wave, ought to be the recognition that these features of traveling of dependence of entangledness are actually constitutive of memory. And very much interrelated with this idea of homogeneity are a number of studies which treated memory as a tangible phenomenon. So one might think of studies that center on embodiments of memory like memorials, museums, and novels. And of course, we can study memorials, museums, and novels as memory scholars, but the problem is, and Jeff Oleg has a very nice quotation of this, is that the postulate that memory is a thing is often accompanied with the idea that collective memory represents or mirrors the pre-representation of the past. Of course, that's sort of a slippery road that we don't want to take as memory scholars because we don't want to uncover alleged facts. We don't want to do a history of facts prior to interpretation. But as memory scholars, what we want to get is the history of the interpretations and how that has changed. So with this sort of criticism that draws on Ea and Oleg, what have we actually proposed? Another visualization. Um, which captures to some extent what entangled memory is about. So the idea is that there are, so there are two underlying assumptions. The one is that on a diachronic level, current mnemonic discourses engage with older mnemonic patterns. So for instance, in my case, <coughs> contemporary Russian youth mobilization engages with Soviet and pre-Soviet narratives of certain elements of the past. And thereby, present interpretations always update older interpretations. They carry them forward over time. Um, and these interpretations on a diachronic dimension can refer to the same mnemonic signifier, the changing meaning of the great patriotic war or war over time, or other elements in the past that are entangled with that particular mnemonic signifier, for instance, of the same world war. Um, and so we can see that in contemporary Russian youth mobilization, where youth reiterates interpretation of the war, which were established during the Soviet times, and then oppositional groups take up these narratives, play with them, mock them, turn them sort of into turn them absurd. And this this thing I think brings us to the synchronic dimension, because of course the temporal dimension is always linked to through time and on a point in time. Um, and in order to make sense of the current controversies in Russia's interpretation of the past, I think it's important to look at the, the constitutive field of the confrontations between different youth groups. And this polyphony is of course nothing new, and Christian mentioned this morning Halflax. And of course it's an idea that already Halflax formulated, right? That we all form part of different social frames. We are, and Halflax speaks about family, religion, and nation, and we are all part of these same three, of these three frames, which all overlap. So there's a polyphony in each act of remembrance, and so that is what the synchronic dimension. So. Okay, so from the abstract down to the hard empirical ground. Um, as I said at the opening, during the collapse of the Soviet Union under Gorbachev's leadership, the new spaces that opened in the Komsomol um, undermined the social position of the official youth organization. And the Komsomol in the early 1980s was one of the largest Soviet organizations which, around, which had around 42 million members, according to contemporary sources. So that's quite yeah, that matters, right, for, for society. However, when youth began to turn its back to that organization, um, 
the narratives of what youth meant in public discourse also changed. And as I said, it's the informality which emerged, and the meaning of this informality itself also has an interesting diachronic dimension because it referred to older meanings of youth which mobilized against the establishment. So anti-establishment, youth behavior, under Stalinism, all this Stiliadi, which existed in the 1950s. Um, and I think that's the relevant space of experience, to begin with, for 2005, when the Kremlin began to establish pro-Kremlin movements, such as the anti -fascist, democratic anti-fascist movement Nashi, um, or Maladaya Gvardia, so they have regard. Um, so that illustrates the extent to which the contemporary Russian leadership actually drew on lessons learned from the past in order not to don't, we can't lose youth once again because that was so dramatic in the 1980s. So that sort of points to the diachronic dimension to speak the language of entangled memory. Um, and of course it also points to the synchronic dimension because the memory of youth ignited change during the perestroika reminded part of Russian memory and was reactivated in the context of youth and hard political change in the 2004 post-Soviet space, right? so the number of colored revolutions which might ring a bell in, in Ukraine in particular. Because that underlined for the Russian leadership that actually youth is not only, wasn't only a powerful actor in the past, but also in the present, which contrasts with what youth was to mean in the transition years of the Russian um, And so on a synchronic level, what we, what we can see is that the integration of youth by the Kremlin mobilizing the youth points to changing patterns of interpretations of youth and of the Velvet Revolution's so changes of the 1980s um, in Russia's near abroad. And I think it's in the combination of a synchronic and a diachronic perspective that we can explain why the public and politicians reinterpreted the signified youth through the And this changing discourse is quite, so the change is very striking if you look at what youth did before, it's completely irrelevant. Movements existed such as Ilushi and Mieski walking together, most of the previous um, official youth movement. But of course, as I said, the synchronic dimension is always very complicated, and so most scholars on Russia tend to focus on Nashi and forget that there's actually <coughs> more going on rather than just the official movements. Um, and of course, the overthrow of Yanukovych's government in Ukraine in 2004 also encouraged oppositional youth activities in Russia itself because. One of the main lessons that Russian democratic oppositional youth learned was that they could actually change something, right? A new interpretation of what that means, being used and being involved in, in political. So what they founded was Ibushiviya's Putin, walking without Putin rather than walking together walking with Putin, um, which is a transfer or sort of travel memory from the Ukrainian context to the Russian context. And, and that's where the sort of new media became relevant because all these movements are entirely based to begin with on the blog sphere, on the Russian equivalent of Facebook and, and what have you, Life Journal, etc. Um, but the internet presence is that effective to a point that actually going out from the internet sphere, Russian journalists quickly started to claim that all these movements could mobilize thousands of youth within weeks. And so that created a proper threat to the Russian government. Um, and therefore, all of a sudden, it seemed, it seemed quite plausible that maybe youth would overthrow the Russian government. <coughs> and what happened is that many of the leaders of these youth movements were regularly arrested for three to seven days of preventive measures and, and threatening them. And, and it started with Idushia Vies Putina, which got a little more serious when we, we started to appear in April 2005. And that movement also played with a traveling memory of the Orange Revolution by constantly employing orange, so as their main coloring. So the first act that they undertook was running on Moscow's red square with orange scarves and orange balloons and sort of shouting the slogans of the Orange Revolution. In reality, me, at least that's what um, its leaders tell me, and never more than 30 members. Um, when you look at the journalists, how they spoke about it, of course, the liberal press even has even higher, higher numbers. But in the liberal press, you find five to seven thousand members. But even in regime online publications, you have something like thousand to two thousand members, which, which me was said to have, simply because in that particular transnational <coughs> mnemonic context, that seemed so plausible that at a democratic opposition in Russia, it's more than thirty people, but. 
at least um, the Wachoto of the leader of me told me that, unfortunately, maybe otherwise they would have been successful. Um, and of course, there are a number of other other groups that I'm not going to focus on now, but um, it's just it's important to notice that there are sort of left wing and right wing youth movements in Russia which also interplay with this changing discourse of the memory. What is important from the perspective of the political power is that these people that we know in the West is the democratic youth opposition, so me, we, and walking without Putin and so on, they are all known as the fascists in Russia, which is also very important in terms of the memory, and I'll talk about that in a second. But, but all these groups are, which are non-programmed, and they're all part of the fascist threat. Um, that brings us to the mnemonic layers that we are having in the movement such as Nashi. So Nashi's manifesto was the first real public visibility of the, of, the new, of the new movement, and the manifesto was reprinted in almost every newspaper. It was circulated on the blogs, on the contacts, so the Facebook, the Russian Facebook thing. Um, and it's quite an important document because it contains <coughs> the vision of the past that the movement maintains. It expresses a clear relationship from the present to the past, and it also restricts what other people can say about the past in relation to the movement. Um, and so the first thing that we noticed with Nashi is that it's .su, which is not usual. I mean, that's, that's a conscious de decision, right? The standard Russian domains are .ru, whereas this one's .su. So clear reference to Soviet Union, rather than we, we don't want to be the Russians, but we are a continuity of a certain Soviet Union. Of course, not the Soviet Union of the 1980s, right? Where it all went wrong with Nashi. Um, and Nashi, as well, is sort of intimidated very closely linked with the wider patterns of changing mnemonic patterns. One of them is Alek Asmanov, his amazing song, Made in the USSR, which is the Russian response to Bruce Springsteen's Made in the USR, uh, USA. <laughs> so even if you, if you don't understand Russian, it's, you should listen to this song. Um, because there is sort of an iconography as well, and it draws on a lot of historic pictures that are brought up to justify why he is so proud to be made in the USSR. Mm -hmm. And the worrying thing is that it all starts with his pan-Slavic visions about including Crimea, Ukraine, Moldova, and Belarus into Russia, which of course by 2006 sounded just like fantasy, but here we are, 2014, things are slightly different. Um, but let's go to the manifesto itself and the vision of history that is expressed in there. And I'm sorry for the amount of text, it doesn't really fit on a small screen, but um, it's just it's a couple of quotations which I think are very captivating because so as a, as a meta narrative over the manifesto, I think the, the importance is that history has its relevance because it's directly applicable in the present and it justifies present actions. Um, and the general narrative of this manifesto is that fascist powers, that the West is constantly threatening Russia, and that Nashi's mission is to prevent these Western powers of doing whatever they want to do in Russia. And, and that draws on sort of narratives of the external and internal, an internal enemy, which we had in Soviet and Russian history all throughout, um, and that interlinks with this fascist threat, which is really a very powerful mobilizer in contemporary Russian discourse, and which links to the Crimea case as well, where the Euromaidan activists, they were all accused of being fascists, right? The pro-European Ukraine government, that's a fascist government in, in Russian discourse. And that is so powerful because it's constantly linked back, as here in these quotations, to the fascists of the Second World War. That's omnipresent. It's just, that's the main, the main justification to, to mobilize youth and to, to adopt very nationalist policies. Um, yeah, this risk, this idea of risks and encirclement. And then we've got a second part to this manifesto, which sort of goes back so of course forward, doesn't concentrate on the Second World War, but goes to the perestroika period, the collapse, the greatest geopolitical catastrophe, catastrophe of the 20th century, as Putin famously coined it. Um, and so what Nashi argues is that we have to overcome that past. We need generational renewal, renewal. That period of the bureaucratic defeatists, as they are called, has to be overcome. All these bureaucrats, functionaries, which are older than 30, 35 years, they all have to be sent away, and we have to replace them with Nazi-trained, pro-Russian um, bureaucrats, which are a clear rupture to the perestroika period. Um, so how does the movement enact all that? Because we're interested in movements, and um, not just in what they're writing. 
they're quite active on the streets and they get enormous media attention for that. Um, and so the main thing is always the commemoration of the great patriotic war. So Nasha Padilla, our victory. And that usually that happens mid-May, <coughs> mid-May 2005, the 15th of May 2005 in this case, was the first public action of Nashi, which brought around 50 to 60,000 people on the streets of Moscow. So that's, that's enormous, right? A demonstration of 50,000 people in London. I don't know when that happened last time. And so you've got all these, all these young people who run around the streets, listen to wartime songs, waving Nashi flags. The Russian tricolor is around. Um, you've got these t-shirts which have our victory printed on them with a red star, the national anthem of Russia printed on the back. And then important is that this past again is continuous with the present. It's clearly past but it's relevant for the present. You want to you want to stage the continuity, and that is done, for instance, in 2005. It was done by medals, which sort of had the shape of, of of shell casings, um, inscribed in them was remember the war, protect the motherland. And these medals were given from the veterans to the youth. So the, the older generation in the past gave a clear political mission in the present to, to these people. And, and when you look at sort of testimonies of how these people internalized these events, you find a lot of approval of, sort of this, this narrative that is suggested that we have to combat contemporary fascism. You defended our country on the battlefield. We will save it in the classroom, workshops, and offices. That's one, one citation from, from an activist. And so I guess Nashi sees itself being involved in a struggle to preserve a truthful memory, which underpins the logic of all the others are the fascist threat. And Nashi's display of strength offers a sort of a number of diachronic entanglements, but it's also linked with counter narratives by pro Kremlin movements. Um, and that's the one that I'm thinking about. So that's Roman Dabakhotov, the leader of me, we, this what I would call democratic opposition movements. And they reacted to all these marches that Nashi is offering by walking so the same route but just the other way around and not waving red, white flags or Russian flags, but waving orange flags, wearing orange scarfers and playing with irony, singing songs like Please give us censorship, that Putin, you're our leader, you're our great hero. And so one which interlinks with, I don't know if you saw that, but these songs about Putin's masculinity, which are very well known on the Russian internet, of course. Um, and me does a little more, I mean, every action that the movement undertakes reveals a different set of mnemonic patterns, and it's mocking of authorities and usually with explicit historical references, which the movement then discusses in its blogs, how it updates Soviet anecdotes, Soviet short stories in the present to show that there is a continuity from that past to the present. And one, one example is this one, um, which probably doesn't speak very well to you, but it does to Russians usually. Um, it's a reminder of a Soviet anecdote about a citizen who was standing on the Red Square just with a white panther, nothing written on it, he was just standing there, and of course what happened was the police came along and they started to have a brief conversation, but he was immediately arrested because he was expressing discontent, he was protesting in that Soviet mindset. And that anecdote was kept alive, and we saw, well, actually it's very similar in contemporary Russia, let's try and do it. So they were standing, and their mouth were, you sort of see it, are sealed, so that you, they, were, they couldn't say anything, right? They were tape, solid tape on on their mouth, standing there with white placards. And what happened, the police comes along and they're all taken away. They would have spent seven days, I think, in, in prison. Um, and that's just sort of the thousands, dozens, I guess, of, of these revivals of the past, which are then discussed in the blogs, in the Twitter feeds of these journal, of these, of these movements to, to display the continuity from that past to the contemporary. So then just to, to finish, um, just a few remarks, really, on on the contemporary events, because I think that's also interesting um, at the moment. So in October 2014, um, Echa uh, interviewed Alexei Navalny, who was one of the oppositional leaders, or he still is one of the oppositional leaders in, in Russia, um, and he had to answer the question, well, Krim Nash, that is Crimea Oas, and that's his response, um, which is pretty clear, meaning, well, Crimea is ours, and we should all get over it. That's from the Russian 
oppositional politician. And shortly after that, Mikhail Khodorkovsky agreed on that position, right? Khodorkovsky, the guy who was put in jail by Putin a few years ago. Right, that caused sort of a, a shitstorm on Twitter and in other social media. And what is interesting about that entire debate is what is actually at the heart. And at the heart of that debate is a very confused memory of how Crimea actually became part of Ukraine in 1954. Um, and whether that decision was legitimate. Um, and the problem is in that case that the memory of the transition from uh, Russian Crimea to Ukrainian Crimea can form rather freely because there are no reliable documentation on how that actually took place. So Gwen Sasse, who wrote an entire book on Crimea, so she was looking into, into that transfer and what she came up with that the only official source that you can find is a 1992 publication in a sort of remote Russian historical journal which no one is aware of. And that, of course, means that there are numerous rumors about how alleged to this, this giving of Crimea to Ukraine actually was. And I guess the most prominent rumor that we have in Russia is that Nikita Khrushchev was drunk, that he played poker, that he was about to lose, and that he said, I'm going to put Crimea in, and then he lost. And that's when Crimea became part of <laughs> And of course, that feeds right all these narratives of it's alleged to it, and we have to give it back. Um, okay. And so this a second element to this entire, well, is Crimea part of us or not, is Natalia Baklonskaya, a 34-year-old woman, the prosecutor general of the Republic of Crimea, and she gave a number of speeches justifying that Crimea should be Russian. And so when she stepped down, she worked for the Ukrainian civil service before, and when she stepped down, she justified her resignation, and I quote, I'm ashamed to live in the country where neo-fascists freely walk about the streets. And with neo-fascists, she means the Euromaidan activists in Kiev. Right? And that yeah, links importantly to, so that's in Russia, it's very prominent. That's, of course, no more dispute that you resign because they're fascists in your country. And that's why she then started to work with, for the Russians. Um, and of course, her look, um, it's hinted at with the left picture, head left-hand side picture, provoked a lot of um, adaptations, in particular in Japan, funny, funny enough, where people started to make anime-style images because of her look, um, starting to call her Nyasha, which means sort of sweetie. Um, you know, with different images. And of course, she underlined that this is just unacceptable, etc., etc. But nevertheless, in, um, in Russian online forums, became very popular this of this slogan which reads Nyash Nyash, Krim Nash. So Nyash Nyash for this sweet blonde girl, Krim Nash, Crimea is ours. Um, and that is existing now in various songs, and all these songs are having as the background the historical layers, historical pictures of the Slavic Union, and we are all part of a, a pan Slavic. Union. <coughs> and the last chip that we are having just every <coughs> scene, um, is sort of maybe a bit of a prediction that all of a sudden the First World War is coming to be a topic in Russian memory. Because so far, <coughs> Nashi and all the other movements, they were all very obsessed about the Second World War, the Great Patriot <coughs> War. And the First World War was simply a war where all these imperialist forces fought against one another, Germany, Britain, France, and the Russian Tsarist Empire. It was quite easy, because the Russian Tsarist Empire was part of the guilty who started the war, and luckily enough it all ended in 1917. There was a memory that people were socialized in and that everyone basically bought. And the war, the First World War, didn't really stir any emotions. It was a neutral determinant. But things changed this summer when a memorial was opened for the fallen soldiers of the First World War on the very same site where the soldiers of the Great Patriotic War are commemorated. Right? So we have got this entanglement of the diachronic of the Second World War and the First World War. And in order to now reinterpret the First World War, we use the same evidence <coughs> that we find on the Second World War. And you've got now a couple of statements where people go about, well, why did Russia actually lose the First World War? And Putin recently said that actually we didn't lose the First World War. <coughs> it stole from us the victory. Um, and therefore, we need to start to commemorate the heroes of the First World War. And Nikolai Stadikov was a nationalist writer. He recently well, made this funny, maybe funny, maybe also worrisome statement about 1917 and that this actually was a conspirational coup by the Brits and liberals in Russia, or in the Soviet Union at the time, but they all speak about Russia. Um, 
And StarDecov might be a little extreme at the moment, but when you look uh, into the online forums of what Nashi is discussing at the moment and other pro Kremlin movements, you can feel that there's a lot of approval of, of such statements um, that the war was stolen from Russia and not from the Soviet Union, which is, is also a very, very interesting reinterpretation. Okay. So, I guess just to conclude, um, I think that the case of contemporary Russian youth mobilizations is just one of the many cases, quite a nice one to explore a little bit this idea of entangled memory, the entangledness of memory in its diachronic and synchronic dimension. And in particular, the Russian youth movement and this fluidity between the movements challenges us to go beyond the heuristics of the second wave of memory studies because it's not about in which group is the memory contained, but it's about the, the cross discourse and the interactions, the traveling of the memory and the interactions between the different groups. And only if we get to that level of the interactions on the synchronic and the diachronic level, I think, we can actually understand what the individual acts of the membrane, what the social and the political relevance of memory in these groups.